Hey folks, before we dive into today's stories, make sure to leave a like and subscribe for more and longer stories. Let's enjoy. Story number one. So I'm not one of those people who believed in ghosts or spirits or any of that crap. I mean, I watched the horror movies like everyone else, but I always thought the Ouija board stuff was just a game. Nothing more. I never thought for a second that anything real could come from it. But now, I wish I never touched it. What happened to me? It still keeps me up at night. It all started a few weeks ago. I was hanging out with my friend Kyle. We were bored, flipping through Netflix, trying to find something to watch when we found this old Ouija board in the back of his closet. He said it had been in his family for years, and that his grandma used to warn him never to use it. But we were drunk, and honestly, it seemed like a good idea at the time. We set it up on his coffee table, lit some candles to set the mood, just for a laugh, and started asking dumb questions like, is anyone there? And what's your name? Kyle kept laughing, saying I was moving the planchette, but I wasn't. At first, nothing happened. But after about 10 minutes, the planchette started moving. At first, we thought one of us was messing around, but I swear to God, neither of us were touching it. It started spelling out weird stuff. At first, it said hello, which we both thought was funny. But then, things got dark, fast. I remember exactly how it spelled it out. D-E-A-T-H. I felt this cold chill run down my spine, and the air in the room seemed to change like it was heavier or something. Kyle laughed it off, but I could see in his eyes that he was freaked out too. I wanted to stop, but something inside me just couldn't. It was like the board had control over us. We kept asking it questions, dumb ones at first, like, are you a ghost? Or do you want to talk to us? Then Kyle asked the one question that ruined everything. What happens when we die? The planchette moved slowly like it was thinking or something, and then it spelled out P-A-I-N. We stared at each other, eyes wide, unsure if we should continue. Then it spelled out Y-O-U-R-S-O-U-L-I-S-N-E-V-E-R-F-R-E-E. -E -E. That's when Kyle pulled his hand away, almost knocking over one of the candles. I wanted to stop too, but something in me needed to know more. I kept my hands on the board, asking, Who, who are you? The board didn't answer right away, but when it did, the letters formed H-E-L-L. -L. I don't know why, but I laughed. It felt so surreal, like I was in some messed up horror movie, and it just couldn't be real. But Kyle wasn't laughing. He was pale, sweating. He kept telling me to stop, but I couldn't. I asked another question. What do you want? The planchette moved faster this time, almost like it was angry. Why, oh, you, asked you, B, D, Y. That's when I freaked out. I threw the board off the table and the planchette flew across the room, hitting the wall. Kyle and I sat there, staring at each other in silence for a minute, trying to process what had just happened, but it wasn't over, not by a long shot. After a few minutes, Kyle's phone started buzzing on the table. I looked down at the screen, and it was full of missed calls, dozens of them, but the weird part. They were all from unknown numbers. Then, Kyle's phone started ringing again. The number was blocked. He looked at me, eyes wide, and I could tell he was too scared to answer it. So, like an idiot... I grabbed the phone and answered. The voice on the other end wasn't human. It was this distorted, deep, guttural sound, like something from a nightmare. It said just one thing before the line went dead. I'm coming. I dropped the phone, my heart pounding in my chest. Kyle looked at me, shaking his head. Dude, what the fuck is going on? We tried to laugh it off, convincing ourselves it was a prank, but deep down we knew something wasn't right. We agreed to never talk about it again and pretend like nothing happened, but that night, everything changed. When I got home, I tried to sleep, but I couldn't. My mind kept racing, replaying the events of the night over and over, and then, at around 3am, I heard this whisper. At first, I thought it was in my head, but it got louder. It wasn't coming from outside, it was coming from inside my bedroom. The whisper was faint but clear. It said, your body isn't yours anymore. I jumped out of bed, flipping on every light in my apartment, checking every room, every closet, every corner. There was nothing. But the whisper didn't stop. It got louder, clearer, like it was right next to me, right inside my head. It kept saying the same thing. 
Your body isn't yours anymore. I tried calling Kyle, but his phone went straight to voicemail. I tried texting him, but no response. I even drove to his house the next morning, but he wasn't there. His car was gone, and his apartment was empty. I haven't heard from him since that night. I didn't go to the police. What would I tell them? That a Ouija board threatened me. They'd locked me up in a psych ward, but now things are getting worse. Every night I hear that whisper. It follows me everywhere. It's like it's inside me, and now I can feel it. It's not just in my head anymore. It's in my skin, crawling, like something's trying to break out. I don't know how much longer I can take this. I think it's trying to take over. I don't feel like myself anymore. Every time I look in the mirror, I see something else staring back at me, something darker, something not human. I don't know how to stop it. I don't think I can. Whatever came through that board, it's not done with me. And I'm starting to wonder if the afterlife is just the beginning of something worse. I'm scared to sleep, scared to close my eyes, because I don't think I'm the one who's going to wake up in the morning. This isn't a joke. Don't play with Ouija boards. I wish I never had. The days after that night were a blur. It was like the world around me shifted. Everything felt wrong. People at work noticed too. They'd ask why I looked tired, why I was acting weird. But how do you tell someone that you're being haunted by a voice inside your head? I didn't want to sound like I was losing it. Maybe I was. It wasn't just the whisper anymore. That was bad enough. But soon, I started seeing things. Small at first. Shadows out of the corner of my eye that disappeared when I turned to look. The feeling of someone standing right behind me, watching. But when I turned around, there was no one there. One morning I woke up covered in scratches. They weren't deep, but they were there. Thin red lines running across my arms and chest like someone had been clawing at me while I slept. I thought maybe I did it to myself in my sleep, but then I looked closer. The marks didn't look like they came from my nails. They were too precise, like someone else had done it. I stopped sleeping after that. I spent nights sitting in front of my computer trying to keep myself awake. Coffee, energy drinks, anything to stay up. But the longer I stayed awake, the more things started to get worse. The shadows weren't just in the corners of my vision anymore. They were everywhere. Dark figures standing in my room, by the door, in the hallway. I'd blink, and they'd be gone. But I knew I wasn't imagining it. They were real. They had to be. And then, Kyle's face showed up on my phone. I remember just staring at it. The phone vibrating in my hand. It had been days since I last heard from him since the Ouija board incident. I tried texting and calling him, but there had been nothing but silence. My heart pounded as I answered, and the line was quiet for a moment. All I could hear was breathing on the other end. Kyle, I said, my voice shaking, nothing, just breathing. Kyle, man, if this is you, say something, I demanded. But all I got in response was this strange, low groaning sound like someone was in pain. Then, out of nowhere, a deep, raspy voice that wasn't Kyle's came through the speaker. It said, He's with us now. My heart stopped. I couldn't breathe. I wanted to scream, but my voice was caught in my throat. Before I could react, the line went dead. I stared at the phone, my hands trembling, unsure what the hell had just happened. That voice. I've never heard anything like it before. It was cold, emotionless, and... wrong. It didn't belong in this world. I tried calling the number back, but it wouldn't connect. My screen flashed, number not in service. I dialed again and again, but the same message kept popping up. It didn't make sense. That's when I realised Kyle was gone. Whatever I had spoken to, it wasn't him. But that wasn't the worst part. The real terror came that night. I hadn't slept in three days at this point. My body was exhausted, but every time I closed my eyes, I'd see faces twisted, grotesque faces with empty eyes, mouths hanging open like they were screaming but no sound came out. I tried to ignore it, but they wouldn't go away. Then, at around 2am, I heard a knock at my door. It wasn't loud, just a soft, rhythmic tapping. At first, I thought I was imagining it, that maybe I was finally starting to hallucinate from lack of sleep, but it kept going. Knock, knock, knock. I grabbed a kitchen knife and crept toward the door, my heart racing. I stood there for a moment, listening. The knocking had stopped, but the silence that followed was somehow worse. It was like the air itself had frozen, and I couldn't hear anything. Not the wind outside, not the cars, not even my own breathing. 
I don't know what made me do it, but I reached for the door handle. Slowly I opened it, expecting to see... I don't know, something. But there was no one there. Just a small wooden box sitting on the ground. My gut told me not to touch it, to leave it alone. But curiosity got the best of me. I picked it up, bringing it inside and placing it on the kitchen table. The thing was old. Like, really old. There were strange carvings on the top, symbols I didn't recognise. But the most unsettling part. My name was carved into the side, clear as day. Who the hell would leave this? My hands shook as I opened the box and inside was the Ouija board planchette. The same one Kyle and I had used. My heart sank into my stomach. I'd thrown that thing across the room. How the hell had it gotten here? But there was something else in the box. A piece of paper folded neatly under the planchette. I unfolded it, my hands trembling. The paper was old, yellowed with age, but what was written on it chilled me to my core. It was a single sentence. He's waiting for you. I dropped the paper and stumbled back, nearly knocking over the chair behind me. My head was spinning. None of this made sense. Was this some kind of sick joke? But deep down, I knew it wasn't. This was real. I tried to throw the box away to get rid of the planchette, but no matter what I did, it kept coming back. Every time I'd turn around, there it was, sitting on the kitchen table, like it had never left. It was like the board had latched onto me, refusing to let go. And the whispering. The whispering was worse now, louder, more insistent. It wasn't just at night anymore. I could hear it during the day too while I was at work, while I was driving, while I was taking a shower. It was relentless. You're next. Your body isn't yours. You'll never escape. I started to lose track of time. Days blended together, and I felt like I was living in some sort of nightmare, one I couldn't wake up from. I didn't leave my apartment. I couldn't. Every time I tried, something would stop me. An overwhelming sense of dread that would paralyze me just as I reached the door. It felt like I was being watched. No matter where I went in my apartment, I could feel eyes on me. But whenever I turned around, there was no one there. The shadows were darker now, more solid. I could see them standing in the corners, waiting. And then, last night, I saw him. I woke up to the sound of a heavy breathing. But it wasn't mine. It was coming from the foot of my bed. I froze, my heart hammering in my chest. Slowly I turned my head, and there he was. A figure, tall and thin, standing in the shadows. His face was pale, almost sickly, and his eyes, they were black, completely black. He didn't move. He just stood there, staring at me with those dead eyes. I wanted to scream, but no sound came out. I was paralysed, my body locked in place, unable to move. The figure stepped closer, slowly, deliberately, until he was standing right next to me. I could feel his cold breath on my skin, smell the rotting stench that clung to him. And then he leaned in close, his lips almost touching my ear, and whispered, He's waiting for you. When I finally snapped out of it, the figure was gone, but the fear stayed with me. I don't know who or what he is, but I'm not sure I can survive much longer. It's getting harder to think straight now. I can barely tell what's real anymore. Sleep, if I can even call it that, comes in short, fractured bursts, filled with nightmares that feel more like memories. I can't escape them. Can't shake this feeling that whatever was haunting me wasn't just in my head. It's in my house. In my life. I've stopped going to work. It's not like I had a choice. Every time I stepped out of the apartment, something would pull me back in. I'd get as far as the door, but the second I touched the handle, that same cold dread would rush over me, making it impossible to leave. It's like the apartment became a prison, and the shadows, the things I thought were in my mind, became my jailers. The worst part? I started hearing them. Not just the whispers, but voices. Human voices. Or at least they sounded human. They called my name. They talked about me. But not like they were people. No. The way they talked was like I was a piece of meat. Something they were getting ready to tear apart. There was one night. God, I'll never forget it. I was lying on the couch, too afraid to sleep in my bed after what happened with that figure. The room was dark except for the flickering of the TV playing some stupid late night show I wasn't even watching. I kept hearing scratching at the walls but I tried to ignore it. I needed to ignore it. Then I heard footsteps. 
I thought I was losing my mind, but these were real. They started faint in the hallway outside my apartment, slow and deliberate, like someone was creeping toward my door. I sat up, staring at the door, waiting for the knock. But the knock never came. Instead, the footsteps continued, this time inside my apartment. I don't remember opening the door for anyone. I would have heard it. But these footsteps, they were heavier, louder now, as if something was pacing back and forth in the hallway just outside the living room. I couldn't move. I couldn't breathe. My eyes were locked on the doorway, waiting for something to step out of the shadows, something that shouldn't have been there. My heart was racing, pounding so hard I thought it might burst out of my chest. Then, the figure appeared. It was standing there, right at the edge of the living room, staring at me. I didn't recognise it at first. It looked like a man, but there was something wrong. His face was blurred, like static on a TV, and his body didn't move right. His head tilted just slightly, as if he was studying me, and then he took a step forward. I backed up against the couch, my hands gripping the cushion so hard my knuckles turned white. I wanted to scream, to get up and run, but my body wouldn't listen. My voice was gone. I could only watch as he took another step, then another, moving closer to me. The smell hit me before he got too close. A rancid stench, like rotting meat left out in the sun for days. Who are you? I finally choked out, my voice barely above a whisper. I didn't expect an answer, but I got one. His mouth opened, and the words that came out didn't match the movements of his lips. It was like someone else was speaking through him, the voice distorted and too loud for the room. We have your soul. That's when I lost it. I scrambled off the couch, running for the kitchen, grabbing the nearest thing I could find, a butcher knife. My hand was shaking so badly I nearly dropped it, but I held it out in front of me, trying to look brave, even though I knew it was useless. Whatever that thing was, it wasn't human. A knife wasn't going to stop it, but it didn't move. It just stood there, staring at me, head tilted, like it was waiting for something. My skin was crawling, every instinct telling me to run, but there was nowhere to go. I was trapped in my own home, cornered by something that shouldn't even exist. Then, without warning, the figure vanished. One second it was there, the next it was gone, like it had never been there at all. The only thing left was that smell, that awful, rotting stench lingering in the air. I dropped the knife, collapsing onto the kitchen floor, my body shaking uncontrollably. I stayed there for what felt like hours, my mind racing, trying to make sense of what just happened. Was I losing it? Was this all in my head? But then I remembered the voices, the whispering, the footsteps, the figure. It couldn't have all been in my head. This was real, and whatever it was, it wasn't finished with me. The next few days were a blur. I barely ate, barely slept. I couldn't. Every time I closed my eyes, I'd see that figure standing at the edge of the room, watching me. The voices were louder now, more persistent. They'd call my name in the middle of the night, taunting me, telling me I couldn't escape. I knew I had to do something. I couldn't just sit there and let this thing take over my life. So... I did what any sane person would do. I went back to where it all started. I went back to the Ouija board. I don't know what I was thinking. Maybe I thought I could fix it, undo whatever I'd done. Maybe I just wanted answers. But I pulled the board out of the closet, setting it up on the kitchen table just like the first time. I lit the candles, placed my hands on the planchette and took a deep breath. Who are you? I asked, my voice shaking. For a moment, nothing happened. The planchette stayed still and I almost felt relieved like maybe it was all just some horrible nightmare. But then, slowly, it began to move. I watched as the letters spelled out a single word. Demon. My heart stopped. I wanted to pull my hands away, to throw the board across the room and never look at it again. But something kept me there. Something stronger than fear. What do you want? I whispered. The planchette moved again, faster this time. Your body. I pulled my hands back, stumbling away from the table. My whole body was shaking, my mind racing. It wanted my body. It wasn't just trying to scare me, it was trying to take me. And then the voice came back, louder this time, more insistent. You can't hide from us, we are inside you. I screamed, throwing the board across the room. The planchette clattered to the floor, but the voice didn't stop. It echoed in my head, louder and louder, until I thought my skull might split open. We are inside you. 
I ran to the bathroom, splashing cold water on my face, trying to snap out of it, but the voice wouldn't stop. I could feel something crawling under my skin, something alive. I looked in the mirror, and for a second, I didn't recognise the person staring back at me. My eyes were dark, hollow, and there was something behind them, something not human. I knew then that I was running out of time. I didn't leave the bathroom for hours after that. I just sat there on the cold tile floor, staring at my reflection, trying to convince myself that this wasn't happening, that I wasn't being taken over by some thing from the other side. But every time I looked into the mirror, I saw it, the darkness behind my eyes growing stronger, creeping in like a virus. I was losing myself, and it was winning. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't go to the police, couldn't go to a doctor. What would I say? That a demon from a Ouija board was trying to take over my body? They'd lock me in a psych ward and throw away the key? No, I had to deal with this on my own. But how? That's when I remembered something Carl's grandma used to say, back when we were kids. She was one of those old-school, deeply religious types, always talking about the devil and evil spirits. I hadn't thought about her in years, but now her words rang in my head like a bell. When you invite darkness in, you have to fight it with light. It sounded crazy, but I was desperate. I needed something, anything, to stop what was happening to me. So, I did the only thing I could think of. I started searching online for ways to get rid of a demon. I know, I know. It sounds stupid, but I didn't have any other options. I spent hours going down rabbit holes, reading about exorcisms, rituals, everything. Most of it seemed like nonsense, but then I found something that gave me a sliver of hope. It was a forum post, buried deep in some obscure paranormal site, from a guy who claimed to have gone through the same thing I was going through. He said the only way to break the connection with a demon was to destroy the object that invited it in. The Ouija board. At first I didn't believe it. How could destroying a board stop something that had already gotten inside me? But as I kept reading, it started to make sense. The board was the gateway, the thing that let the demon in. If I destroyed it, maybe, just maybe, it would sever the connection. So that night, I did it. I grabbed the Ouija board from the corner where I had thrown it and took it out to the alley behind my apartment. It was cold, the wind biting at my skin as I stood there, staring down at the board in my hands. I hesitated for a moment. Part of me was terrified that if I destroyed it, things would get worse, but I didn't have a choice. I smashed it. The board cracked in half with a loud snap, pieces of wood flying everywhere. I grabbed a metal trash can, threw the pieces inside and lit a match. The flames roared to life, consuming the board, the planchette, everything. I stood there, watching the fire burn, waiting for, I don't know, something, a sign maybe, something to tell me it had worked, but nothing happened. I went back inside, my heart heavy with disappointment. I thought it was over, but it wasn't. If anything, that's when things got worse. That night I woke up to a sound that still haunts me to this day. It was a low guttural growl like an animal, but not. It was coming from the corner of my room. I sat up, my heart pounding in my chest, and there it was. Him. The same figure I'd seen before, but this time, he wasn't just standing there. He was crawling toward me. I froze. I wanted to run, to scream, but my body wouldn't move. The figure's limbs moved in a way that shouldn't have been possible, joints bending in unnatural angles, his body twitching as he dragged himself across the floor. His face. God, I'll never forget his face. It was rotting. Flesh hanging off his skull, his mouth stretched into this grotesque grin that split his face in half, showing rows of jagged, broken teeth. He stopped at the foot of my bed, and for a moment everything went silent. I could feel my pulse in my ears, my breath coming in short, panicked gasps. And then slowly he raised his head, those black, empty eyes locking onto mine. I told you, you can't escape. The voice wasn't just in my head this time, it was real. I heard it clear as day, that same distorted, inhuman voice that had spoken to me through the phone. But now, it was here, in the room with me. I don't know how I did it, but I managed to pull myself out of bed, scrambling to the door. My legs felt like lead my whole body trembling as I fumbled with the lock, desperate to get out. But the door wouldn't open. I yanked at it, my hand slipping on the knob, and that's when I felt it. Something cold, icy cold, wrapping around my ankle. I looked down, and there it was, 
his hand. Long, skeletal fingers, blackened and rotting, gripping my leg like a vice. I screamed, kicking at him, but it was no use. His grip was too strong. You're mine now, he whispered, his voice slithering into my ears like poison. There's no one left to save you. I don't know where the strength came from, but I kicked harder, my foot connecting with his face. There was a sickening crunch, and his grip loosened just enough for me to break free. I threw the door open and ran, ran out of my apartment, down the stairs, out into the street, barefoot and in my pyjamas. I didn't stop running until I was halfway across town, gasping for air, my heart feeling like it was about to explode. I collapsed onto the sidewalk, trembling, my mind racing. I couldn't go back. I couldn't. But where could I go? I had no family nearby, no close friends. I was alone. That's when I remembered Kyle. I don't know why I hadn't thought of it sooner. He was the one who had been there with me when all of this started. He had to know something. Maybe he was going through the same thing I was. I had to find him. I spent the next two days searching for him. Calling old friends, checking social media, even driving past his apartment. But it was like he had disappeared. No one had seen him. No one knew where he was. It was like he had never existed. And then, just when I was about to give up, I got a message. It was an email from an address I didn't recognise. The subject line just said, Kyle, and my heart skipped a beat. I opened it, and all it said was this, I'm sorry, there's no way out. You need to run. That's when I knew. Kyle was gone. And if I didn't do something, I would be next. But where the hell could I run to? I spent the next few days moving between cheap motels, trying to keep on the move, thinking that maybe if I didn't stay in one place too long, it couldn't find me. But deep down, I knew it was pointless. You can't outrun something that's inside you. The thing is, it didn't matter where I went. The voices followed. Louder now, more vicious. They weren't just whispers anymore, they were screams, and it wasn't just in my head. Sometimes, in the middle of the night, I'd hear them outside my door, clawing at the walls, pounding against the thin motel room doors like they were trying to break through. They never did, but every time the noise stopped, I could feel them getting closer. And the worst part? The figure. He didn't just haunt the dark corners of my apartment anymore. He started appearing in my dreams, watching, always watching. But now, I'd wake up to find scratches on my skin, deep, jagged marks like something had tried to tear me apart in my sleep. I knew I was losing it. My mind was breaking, but I didn't want to die. I didn't want it to win. So I did the last thing I could think of. I went to a church. I hadn't stepped inside one since I was a kid. I wasn't religious, but something about being in a place like that made me think maybe it could help. Maybe I could find a way to fight back. Desperation makes you believe in all kinds of things. I sat in the back pew, the cold wood digging into my spine, staring at the altar. It was late, almost empty, just a few scattered people sitting quietly, their heads bowed in prayer. I didn't know how to pray. I just sat there, my hands shaking, hoping for, I don't even know, a miracle, maybe. That's when I heard it again. The voice, low and guttural, coming from right behind me. You really think this will save you? I froze. My heart stopped. My breath caught in my throat. I didn't want to turn around. Didn't want to see what was there. But I knew. I knew. Slowly I turned my head, and there he was. The figure. He was standing at the back of the church, just inside the door, his eyes locked on me. But this time, he wasn't alone. The shadows. Those twisted, grotesque figures I'd been seeing out of the corner of my eye, they were with him now, creeping along the walls, crawling across the floor toward me. I jumped up, stumbling down the aisle toward the front of the church. The priest was there, standing by the altar, his back to me. I ran to him, my voice coming out in panicked gasps. Help me, I begged. Please, you have to help me. The priest turned around, his face calm, almost too calm. He looked at me like he'd been expecting me. He didn't ask questions, didn't try to calm me down. He just nodded like he understood. We'll begin, he said, leading me to a small room in the back of the church. It was dimly lit, just a few candles flickering on the walls. He pulled out a chair and motioned for me to sit. I did, my leg shaking so badly I could barely stand. He didn't waste time. He started muttering prayers under his breath in a language I didn't understand. Latin, maybe. His voice was steady, 
but I could feel the weight of it, like the air in the room had shifted, becoming thick, oppressive. That's when the room got cold, freezing cold. I could see my breath in front of me, fogging up the air. The candles flickered, their flames sputtering, and then, one by one, they went out. The priest's voice faltered, just for a second, but it was enough. The shadows in the corners of the room began to move, crawling along the walls, their limbs twisting and contorting in ways that shouldn't have been possible. And then the figure appeared. He stepped out of the darkness, his body hunched, his eyes black as coal, grinning that same grotesque grin. But this time he wasn't alone. The shadows followed him, their hands clawing at the floor, their faces twisted in silent screams. I tried to move, to get up, to run, but I couldn't. My body was frozen in place, held there by some invisible force. The figure took a step closer, his rotten, skeletal hand reaching out toward me. This won't work, the voice said, but it wasn't coming from the priest. It was coming from the figure. His mouth wasn't moving, but the words filled the room, heavy and suffocating. You can't get rid of me. You invited me in. You belong to me. The priest stepped forward, raising a small crucifix in his hand. He muttered something in Latin again, louder this time, his voice trembling but firm. The shadows recoiled, shrinking back, but the figure, he just laughed. A low, guttural laugh that sent chills down my spine. The priest tried again, his voice rising, shouting now, but it didn't matter. The figure reached out, his hand closing around the crucifix. There was a crack, like the sound of bones breaking, and the crucifix shattered in his hand, pieces of wood clattering to the floor. I felt it then, a cold, searing pain in my chest, like something was ripping me apart from the inside. I screamed, falling to the floor, clutching my chest. The pain was unbearable, like fire, like ice, like every nerve in my body was being torn apart. And then, just as suddenly as it had started, the pain stopped. I opened my eyes, gasping for breath, and saw the figure standing over me. He crouched down, his face inches from mine, that sickening grin spreading across his rotten face. You're mine, he whispered, his breath cold against my skin. You always were. The shadows closed in around me, their hands grabbing at my arms, my legs pulling me down into the darkness. I tried to fight, but it was no use. The figure just watched, smiling, as I was dragged into the abyss. And then, nothing. I don't know how long I was out. When I woke up, I was lying on the floor of the church, alone. The priest was gone. The room was empty, cold, silent. I dragged myself to my feet, my body aching, and stumbled out into the main hall. The church was empty, the doors were locked. It was like I had never been there. I don't know what happened. I don't know if I survived. I don't know if I'm still me, but I can feel it. The darkness, the figure, him. He's still with me, inside me, waiting. And every night when the lights go out, I hear the voice. You're mine. I don't think I can fight it anymore. Story. Number two. All right, so, I never thought I'd be the kind of person to end up writing a post like this, but here we are. I'm honestly still trying to process what happened. I need to get this out there before I completely lose it. Maybe writing it down will help me make sense of everything, or at least get some of this weight off my chest. But anyway, this all started about a year ago when I did something that, looking back, I wish I never had. So, I'm not really into the paranormal or any of that stuff. I mean, I wasn't anyway. Ghosts, spirits, demons, just not my thing. I've always been more of a sceptic, the kind of guy who rolls his eyes when people talk about hauntings or possessions, but my girlfriend Katie was super into it. Like she had this whole collection of crystals, tarot cards and books on witchcraft. I thought it was kind of cute, honestly, until things got real. It was her idea to mess around with a Ouija board. I didn't take it seriously at all at first. She brought it over one night, giggling, telling me about how she had found it in some old thrift store. You know the type. Dusty shelves. Old lady at the counter. Probably cursed or some shit. The thing looked ancient. The wood was chipped in places, the letters were faded, and it had this weird musty smell, like it had been sitting in someone's damp basement for decades. I shrugged it off and joked, You really think this thing works? She just grinned and said, It's just for fun. Don't be such a buzzkill. So, yeah, we set it up in my living room. It was just me, her and her friend Amanda. We turned off all the lights, lit a few candles, 
because that's apparently how you're supposed to do it, and got started. Katie and Amanda were way into it, while I just played along, not really expecting anything to happen. Katie started asking the usual questions. Is anyone there? That kind of crap. At first, the planchette didn't move. We were sitting there for what felt like forever, just waiting. I remember rolling my eyes, thinking this was the dumbest thing I'd ever done. But then, after like 15 minutes of awkward silence, the damn thing moved. At first, it was subtle, like maybe one of them was pushing it just to freak me out. But the planchette slid slowly to yes. We all kind of looked at each other, and I could tell Katie and Amanda were excited, but I was still sceptical. I figured they were just messing with me. Katie asked again, What's your name? The planchette spelled out something weird. The letters didn't make any sense, like it wasn't a name I recognised, just a random string of letters, S-L-V-I-A-N. I remember feeling this strange chill when I saw it, like maybe this wasn't just a game, but I didn't say anything. I didn't want to sound like a little bitch. Amanda asked the next question. How did you die? The planchette shot across the board, way faster this time. It spelled out W-A-T-C-H. I thought that didn't make any sense, so I just kind of laughed it off. But then the planchette started moving again, and this time it spelled out W-A-T-C-H-Y-O-U-R-B-A-C-K. Katie stopped laughing. Amanda too. The whole room got heavy. You know when you can just feel the air change? It was like that. The candles flickered, and I remember thinking it was just the wind, but there wasn't any draught in the room. Katie nervously asked, What do you mean by that? The planchette didn't move for a minute. Just as we were about to call it quits and blow out the candles, it started moving again, real slow. It spelled out N-O-T-H-I-N-G. We sat there in silence. I remember my heart was pounding. Amanda, being the smart one, was like, OK, that's enough, I'm done. She took her hands off the board and Katie followed suit, but I kept my hands on it. I don't know why, but something made me want to ask one more question. I asked, can I speak to anyone? The planchette went wild. It moved in circles, faster and faster, and then shot to the word yes. Katie was looking at me like I was insane, but I couldn't stop. I asked, how? The board spelled out A-S-K-T-H-E-M. I asked who them was, but it didn't answer. The planchette just stopped moving entirely, like whatever was on the other side didn't want to talk anymore. We blew out the candles, packed up the board, and I tried to forget about it. But that was just the beginning. That night, when Katie and Amanda left, I couldn't sleep. I kept thinking about what the board had said. Watch your back. Ask them. It didn't make any sense, but something about it stuck with me. I figured it was just my imagination running wild. That's what I wanted to believe. Around 2am, I started hearing noises. I live alone, so there shouldn't have been anything but the usual creaks and groans of an old house. But this was different. It sounded like whispering. Like someone was talking just outside my bedroom door. I sat up in bed, straining to listen, but I couldn't make out the words. My heart was racing and my stomach felt like it was twisted into knots. I told myself it was nothing, just the wind or maybe the pipes. I laid back down, but as soon as I closed my eyes, I felt it. You know that feeling when someone's watching you? That was exactly what I felt. I opened my eyes, and standing in the corner of my room was a shadow. At first, I thought it was just a trick of the light. Maybe the shadows from the streetlights outside my window. But then it moved. It stepped closer, and I swear to God I heard a voice low and raspy. It said, Ask them. I froze. I didn't know what to do. I was too scared to move, too scared to even scream. The shadow kept getting closer, and I could feel this overwhelming sense of dread, like something terrible was about to happen. I wanted to get up, to run, but my body wouldn't respond. It was like I was paralysed. The shadow stopped at the foot of my bed. I could feel its presence, cold and suffocating. It leaned over me, and I could hear its breathing, slow and ragged, like it was struggling to inhale. My body felt like it was sinking into the mattress and the air around me got so thick I could barely breathe. Then it spoke again, louder this time. Ask them. And just like that, it was gone. The room was silent. The air was normal again. I bolted upright, panting, drenched in sweat. 
My heart was pounding so hard I thought it might explode. I looked around the room, but there was nothing. No shadow, no voice, just me. I didn't sleep at all that night. I couldn't. I just sat in bed, staring at the door, waiting for something else to happen, but nothing did. The next morning, I tried to convince myself it was all a dream, a nightmare brought on by the Ouija board, but deep down, I knew it wasn't. I could still hear the voice, that raspy whisper, echoing in my head. Ask them. But I didn't know who them was, and worse, I didn't know if I wanted to find out. So, yeah. I didn't sleep after that night. For days, I couldn't shake this feeling that something was wrong. It wasn't just a lingering sense of dread. It was like my entire life felt off balance. You know when you have this gut feeling that something's watching you, but when you turn around, there's nothing? It was like that 24-7. Katie noticed too. She asked me what was up, and I told her it was nothing, just some bad dreams. I didn't want to freak her out with what I was actually experiencing. Not yet, at least. I was still trying to convince myself that maybe it was just my imagination, but deep down, I knew better. Then one night, a few days after the shadow incident, I got a phone call. It was around midnight, and I remember being surprised because no one ever calls me that late. The number was blocked, but I answered anyway. I could hear breathing on the other end, this slow, raspy breathing, like someone was struggling to get air. My heart sank. It was the same sound I'd heard in my room that night. I said, hello, but no one answered. The breathing continued, growing heavier and more laboured. I was about to hang up when, just before I could, a voice finally spoke. It wasn't like the whispers from the shadow. This was clear. Too clear. It said, why haven't you asked them? I hung up immediately. My hands were shaking and my chest felt tight like I couldn't catch my breath. I stood there, holding my phone, just staring at the screen, hoping to see the number pop up again so I could block it. But it didn't. I was rattled, but I still didn't want to tell anyone. Katie would think I was losing it. And Amanda, well, she already said she was done with the Ouija board stuff, so bringing it up to her seemed pointless. I was on my own. The next few nights were quiet, almost like things had gone back to normal, but I should have known better. One night, around 3am, that stupid witching hour crap you always hear about, I woke up to this scratching sound. At first I thought it was my cat, but then I remembered I didn't have a cat. The noise was coming from the walls, this faint but deliberate scratching, like nails dragging across wood. I tried to ignore it, hoping it was just mice or something, but it got louder, more intense, like whatever it was wanted me to hear it. I got out of bed, grabbed the nearest thing I could find, a baseball bat I kept under the bed just in case, and started walking around my apartment, listening for the source. It led me to the hallway, just outside my bedroom. That's when I noticed something new, the door to my attic. Now, before this, I had never even thought about the attic. I live in an old building, and the hatch to the attic is one of those old-school ones you need a ladder to reach. I've been in this apartment for two years and never once had a reason to go up there. But as I stood in the hallway, staring at the hatch, I realised the scratching was coming from directly above it. And then, as if someone was answering my thoughts, the hatch creaked open. I stood there, frozen. It wasn't fully open, just enough for a thin sliver of darkness to be visible. But I could feel it. Something was up there. And whatever it was, it was watching me. My brain was screaming at me to close it, to run back to my room, lock the door and pretend I hadn't seen anything. But my body? My body had other plans. Before I even realised what I was doing, I was grabbing a chair from the kitchen and dragging it underneath the hatch. I climbed up slowly, the bat in one hand, my heart pounding so loud I could hear it in my ears. I pushed the hatch all the way open and poked my head inside. The attic was pitch black, even though I knew there was a tiny window up there that should have let some moonlight in. I fumbled for my phone, turned on the flashlight and scanned the space. At first, I didn't see anything. Just a bunch of old junk left by the previous tenants. Boxes, old furniture, some dusty Christmas decorations. But then, in the far corner I saw it. A box. A small wooden box that definitely hadn't been there when I moved in. The wood looked just as old and worn as the Ouija board Katie had brought over and just seeing it made my stomach turn. Something about it felt wrong. I wanted to leave. 
every instinct was telling me to get the hell out of there. But instead, I stepped into the attic and made my way toward the box. My phone light flickered as I got closer, and I swear the air around me got colder, like the temperature had dropped ten degrees. I reached out and touched the box. The second my fingers made contact with the wood, I heard a voice, clear as day. It whispered right into my ear, even though no one was there. Ask them. I jerked my hand back and stumbled, dropping my phone in the process. It clattered to the floor and for a moment the room went pitch black. I scrambled to pick it up and as soon as I turned the flashlight back on, I saw something that made my blood run cold. There were handprints, dark, greasy handprints smeared across the dusty floor leading from the box to where I was standing. They were small, like a child's, but distorted, like the fingers were too long, too thin, and they were fresh. I bolted. I didn't even bother closing the hatch as I climbed down. I ran to my bedroom, slammed the door shut and locked it. I sat on the floor with my back against the door, gripping the baseball bat like it was the only thing keeping me alive. For the rest of the night I didn't move, I didn't sleep. All I could do was sit there, staring at the shadows in the corner of my room, waiting for them to move again, but they didn't. The next morning I called Katie. I couldn't keep it to myself anymore. I told her everything, the shadow, the phone call, the attic, the box. At first she thought I was just messing with her, trying to scare her. But when I didn't laugh or brush it off, she realised I was serious. She came over that afternoon and I took her up to the attic. The box was still there, but the handprints were gone. The weirdest part, though. When I opened the box, it was empty. No old trinkets. No cursed objects. Just a hollow wooden shell. Katie tried to calm me down telling me it was probably just my mind playing tricks on me, but I could see it in her eyes. She was freaked out too. We put the box back and left the attic, but I couldn't shake the feeling that whatever was up there wasn't done with me yet. The voice, the phone calls, the shadow, they were all connected somehow, and I knew, deep down, that things were about to get a lot worse. That night, the voices came back, but this time they weren't whispers, they were screams. So... After Katie came over and we found that creepy empty box in the attic, I thought, maybe that was it. Maybe I'd just freak myself out over nothing and the weirdness would stop. But no, things got way worse. And when I say worse, I mean worse. That night after Katie left, I tried to get back to some kind of normal. I made dinner, tried to watch some stupid show on Netflix, but I couldn't focus. My mind kept going back to that box in the attic, those handprints and the whispers, Every shadow in the room felt like it was watching me. I was on edge the whole night, but eventually I managed to pass out on the couch. I didn't even bother going to bed. I don't know how long I was asleep before it started. Maybe an hour or two. I woke up to the sound of scratching again. Same as before, but louder this time. I was still half asleep, groggy and disoriented, so at first I thought I was dreaming. But when I sat up and rubbed my eyes, I realised it was real. The noise was coming from inside the walls again just like before, but it wasn't just scratching anymore. It was accompanied by something else. Screams. Not just one voice, either. It was like a chorus of voices, all screaming at once. Some were high-pitched, others deep and guttural. It sounded like dozens of people were trapped inside my walls, clawing to get out. The worst part? They weren't just screaming in pain, they were screaming my name. At first, I thought it was in my head. Maybe I was still dreaming, but the longer it went on, the more real it felt. The sound was so loud it felt like the walls were vibrating. I could feel the floor beneath my feet trembling, and it was getting harder to breathe. It was like the air in the room was being sucked out, replaced with this thick, suffocating tension. I grabbed my phone, but of course, there was no signal, no Wi-Fi either. The clock on my phone wasn't even working. It was stuck at 3am, which at this point didn't even surprise me. I threw the phone down and covered my ears, trying to block out the noise, but it didn't help. The screams just got louder, more desperate, and now I could hear individual voices breaking through the chaos. Some of them were crying, others were laughing, this horrible, manic laughter that made my skin crawl. One voice, though. It was clear, sharp, and familiar. Katie's voice. I swear to God I heard her. She was crying, and her voice was pleading over and over. Help me. Please, help me. My blood ran cold. I knew it couldn't be her. She had just left my apartment a few hours ago. There was no way she was in my walls. 
but hearing her voice, twisted and desperate, calling out to me like that, it did something to me. I couldn't just sit there. I jumped off the couch and ran to the attic hatch. I didn't even hesitate this time. I just dragged a chair over, climbed up, and yanked the hatch open. I don't know what I was expecting to find, but as soon as I stuck my head up there, the screaming stopped. Dead silence. The kind of silence that makes your ears ring because it's so unnatural. The attic was pitch black, just like before, but I didn't need my phone light to know that something was up there with me. I could feel it. That heavy presence, like I was being watched. Every instinct I had was telling me to get the hell out, to run as fast as I could. But then, I saw it. In the corner of the attic, where the box had been before, there was something else. A figure. It was crouched, huddled in the shadows, but I could make out its shape. Thin. Too thin. Its limbs were long, almost spindly, and its head was tilted at this unnatural angle, like its neck was broken. I couldn't see its face, not clearly at least, but I could see its eyes, glowing, red. I froze. My body locked up and for a moment I couldn't breathe. I couldn't move. I was just staring at this thing, this thing that had been hiding in my attic, watching me. It didn't move, but I could hear it breathing, slow, deep breaths, like it was waiting for me to do something. And then, without warning, it spoke. Ask them! I stumbled back, nearly falling off the chair. My heart was pounding in my chest and my head was spinning. I climbed down as fast as I could, slammed the hatch shut and backed away. But before I could even catch my breath, I heard it, knocking, from inside the walls. Three slow, deliberate knocks, then again, knock, knock, knock. It was coming from every wall in the apartment all at once, like something was trying to get out. My whole body went cold, and I couldn't stop shaking. I backed up against the wall, clutching the bat like it could somehow protect me from whatever the hell was happening, and then I saw it. There, on the living room wall, something started writing itself, scratches forming words right into the plaster. I could barely comprehend what I was seeing, but the words were clear. They spelled out, We see you. We're waiting. My hands were shaking so badly that I dropped the bat. I wanted to scream, but my throat was so tight I couldn't make a sound. The writing continued, more and more words appearing on the walls, spiralling out of control until they covered almost every inch of the space. Ask them. Watch your back. We know your name. Join us. Come closer. The last one hit me like a punch to the gut. Come closer. It was taunting me, daring me to move but there was no way in hell I was going anywhere near that wall. Then out of nowhere I heard Katie's voice again. This time it wasn't coming from the walls, it was coming from my bedroom. She was crying, her voice hoarse and broken. She kept saying, Please, don't leave me, please. I should have known it wasn't her. I should have known. But I was too scared, too shaken up to think straight. I ran to the bedroom, threw the door open, and... Nothing. The room was empty. No Katie. Just the same dark, empty room I'd left behind when I went to the living room. But then, I heard a faint whisper. This time, right behind me. I turned around and there it was again, the shadow. The same one I'd seen before, except now. It wasn't just a vague shape in the corner. It was standing right in front of me. And it wasn't alone. There were more of them. Shadows, but not just shadows. People. Or... Something that used to be people. Their faces were twisted, their bodies deformed like they'd been burned or melted. They were staring at me, their mouths moving in unison, but no sound came out. I stepped back, but they stepped forward. Slowly, deliberately, closing in on me. I could hear that raspy breathing again, like it was coming from all of them at once. I didn't know what to do. My mind was screaming at me to run, but my feet felt like they were glued to the floor. The shadows got closer and closer and then one of them reached out. Its fingers were long and thin, almost skeletal, and it grabbed my arm. The second it touched me, my vision blurred and I felt like I was being pulled, like I was being dragged into something. I saw flashes, images I couldn't explain. A dark room, faces, screaming, blood, so much blood, and then, just as quickly, it all disappeared. I was back in my bedroom, standing there, gasping for air. The shadows were gone, but the mark on my arm wasn't. There, where the shadow had touched me, was a bruise. 
a handprint, black and blue with long bony fingers. It burned, like someone had pressed a hot iron to my skin. That's when I knew this wasn't just some freaky game. This wasn't just my mind playing tricks on me. Whatever I had messed with, whatever I had invited into my life, it was real. And it wasn't going to stop until it got what it wanted, and I had no idea how to make it go away. The next day, Katie stopped answering my calls. I wish I could say that things got better after that night. I wish I could tell you I figured it all out. But if that were true, I wouldn't be writing this right now. The truth is, things got worse. Much worse. After the whole shadow touching me thing and that creepy ass bruise, I did what any sane person would do. I tried to pretend it never happened. I figured if I just ignored it, it would go away. Like when you hear a noise in the middle of the night and tell yourself it's just the wind. But you know how that goes. Denial only works for so long before reality slaps you in the face. The next day I called Katie, but she didn't pick up. I wasn't too freaked out at first. Maybe she was busy. But when the day turned into two days, then three, and she still wasn't answering, I started to worry. I left her a bunch of voicemails, sent texts, and even tried to reach out to Amanda. Amanda told me she hadn't heard from Katie either, which only made things worse. She was supposed to come over and help me figure this out, but now she was just... gone. It wasn't like her to ghost me like that. Katie wasn't the kind of person to just disappear without a word. So I decided to go over to her place and check on her. I'll never forget what happened when I got to Katie's apartment. I knocked on her door for what felt like forever, but no one answered. Her car was parked outside, so I knew she was home. My gut was telling me something was wrong, but I didn't want to believe it. After about ten minutes of knocking, I tried the door handle, and to my surprise, it was unlocked. The second I stepped inside, I knew something was off. The air was thick, heavy, like the kind of humidity you feel right before a storm. Except there was no storm, just this overwhelming, suffocating atmosphere. And the smell. God, the smell was like rotting meat. It was so bad, I gagged. The lights in the apartment were off, but enough sunlight was coming through the windows to see. I called out for Katie, my voice echoing in the eerie silence, but there was no response. I walked through the living room and down the hallway, my heart pounding harder with each step. The further I went, the stronger the smell got. When I reached her bedroom door, I hesitated. Something in me didn't want to open it. It was like my body was screaming at me to turn around and get the hell out of there. But I couldn't. I had to know. I had to see for myself. I opened the door. The first thing I noticed was that her bed was made, perfectly neat, like no one had slept in it for days. But it wasn't the bed that grabbed my attention. It was the writing. The same writing that had appeared on my walls was now scrawled all over hers. Everywhere, from floor to ceiling. We see you. Come closer. We're waiting. But there was one phrase that sent a chill down my spine. Over and over, in huge, jagged letters, it said, She's ours now. I felt like I was going to be sick. My legs were shaking and I could barely stand. I stumbled back out of the room, my mind racing. What the hell did that mean? Where was Katie? My hands were shaking so badly I could barely pull my phone out of my pocket. I called her again, praying she'd pick up, but the call went straight to voicemail just like before. That's when I heard it. A noise coming from the bathroom at the end of the hall. It was faint, but I knew it wasn't just the pipes. It sounded like... shuffling. Like someone moving slowly, deliberately. I called out again, but no answer. I should have left. I know that now. I should have run out of that apartment and never looked back. But I didn't. I moved toward the bathroom, each step feeling like it took a lifetime. The door was slightly ajar, just enough for me to push it open with one hand. I stepped inside and flicked on the light. Katie was there, but she wasn't standing, wasn't moving. She was sitting on the edge of the bathtub, her back to me, her head hanging low. Her hair was matted and filthy like she hadn't washed it in days. She was still wearing the clothes I'd last seen her in, a tank top and pyjama shorts, but they were torn like she'd been clawing at them. Katie... My voice cracked when I said her name. She didn't respond, didn't move. I stepped closer, every nerve in my body screaming at me to stop, but I couldn't. I reached out, my hand trembling as I touched her shoulder. Her skin was ice cold. I slowly turned her around to face me, and that's when I saw it. Her eyes, they were completely black. Not just her irises, 
Her entire eyeballs were like pits of darkness, staring right through me. Her mouth was open in this twisted, unnatural grin, her lips cracked and dry. But the worst part, her fingers. They were covered in blood, nails broken, fingertips raw, like she'd been digging at something. And in her lap she was holding a piece of paper. I didn't want to look, but I had to. I had to know what it said. I reached down, my hand shaking so badly I thought I'd drop it, and picked up the paper. Scrawled in red, smeared across the page in what looked like blood, were three words. You're next, Alex. My blood ran cold. How the hell did it know my name? Katie didn't move. She just sat there, staring at me with those empty black eyes, that twisted grin plastered across her face. I backed up, stumbling over myself, barely able to breathe. I don't even remember how I got out of there, but the next thing I knew, I was outside, sprinting down the street, my heart pounding in my ears. I didn't stop running until I got back to my apartment. I locked the door, every single lock, and collapsed on the floor, gasping for air. I couldn't get her face out of my head, those black eyes, that grin, and that note. How did it know my name? That night, the voices came back. This time, they weren't whispers. They were loud, angry, like they were right there in the room with me. They kept repeating the same words over and over. You're next, you're next, you're next. I covered my ears, but it didn't stop. It was like the voices were inside my head, clawing at my brain. I could hear them all night, even in my dreams. And Katie, she was there too. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw her, sitting in that bathroom, staring at me with those black empty eyes. I couldn't take it anymore. I had to know what was happening. I had to figure this out before it drove me completely insane. I grabbed the Ouija board, the one Katie had brought over, and set it up in the middle of my living room. I know how stupid that sounds. I know. But I was desperate. I had no other choice. I figured if this thing was going to keep tormenting me, I might as well face it head on. I lit some candles, the way we had before, and sat down in front of the board. My hands were shaking, my heart was pounding, but I placed my fingers on the planchette and asked the question I'd been dreading since the beginning. Who are you? The planchette moved immediately faster than it ever had before. It spelled out a name. I don't remember what it was exactly. It wasn't a name I recognised, but it felt ancient. Powerful. I asked the next question, the one I knew I shouldn't ask but had to. What do you want? The planchette paused for a moment, like it was thinking. Then slowly it spelled out two words. Join us. I felt this cold shiver run down my spine, but I couldn't stop. I asked the final question, the one that had been haunting me since the start. What happened to Katie? This time, the planchette didn't move. Not at first. The candles flickered, the air around me grew colder, and I could feel that same heavy presence from the attic. Only this time it was right next to me. I could feel it breathing down my neck. And then, slowly, the planchette moved. It spelled out two more words. She's gone. I haven't seen Katie since that night. I've tried calling her, tried going back to her apartment, but it's like she never existed. Her phone's disconnected, her apartment's empty, and Amanda? She won't even talk to me anymore. She said she doesn't want anything to do with this evil stuff. But I can't just let it go. Not after everything I've seen. Not after what's happened. The shadows in my apartment are still there. They're always watching. Always waiting. I can hear them at night, whispering my name, reminding me that I'm next. And the worst part? That bruise. The one that looked like a handprint. It's spreading. It's funny. I thought after everything I'd be numb by now. You know, desensitised. But here I am, writing this out and my hands are shaking worse than ever. I think a part of me knows what's coming. I think I've known it for a while, but I didn't want to believe it. There's no escaping this. Whatever it is, it's been with me since that night with the Ouija board, and now I'm stuck. I just have to face it. It's been about a week since the last time I saw Katie. I've barely left my apartment since. I've been trying to keep it together, but honestly, I'm losing my mind. I can't sleep anymore. Every time I close my eyes, I hear the whispers. The voices have gotten louder, more aggressive, like they're right there in the room with me. Sometimes I wake up to find words scratched into the walls again, even though I painted over the last ones. They keep saying the same things. We're waiting. You're next. Join us. The worst part, though. 
the bruise. It's not just a bruise anymore. What started as that dark hand-shaped mark has spread across my entire arm, like a network of black veins crawling under my skin. It burns constantly, like my arm is on fire. I've tried everything. Ice, ointments, painkillers. Nothing helps. It's like whatever touched me that night in the attic marked me, and now it's eating me alive. Sometimes I swear I can feel something moving under my skin, like little fingers pressing from the inside. I keep telling myself it's just my imagination, but deep down I know it's not. A couple of days ago I tried to leave. I thought maybe if I got out of the apartment I could shake this thing. I packed a bag, grabbed my keys and headed for the door. But as soon as I touched the doorknob I heard it again. Katie's voice. Don't go. I froze. It was coming from behind me, from inside the apartment. But I knew, deep down, I knew. It wasn't her. Not anymore. I didn't turn around. I couldn't. I just stood there, my hand on the doorknob, listening as her voice got closer, more desperate. Please don't leave me. You can't leave me. It was the same tone she had in the bathroom. That twisted, broken plea. But this time, it was different. There was something wrong about it. Like she wasn't asking me for help anymore. She was demanding it. I could feel her getting closer, feel her breath on the back of my neck like she was right there inches away, and then she laughed. It was soft at first, just a low chuckle, but it built into this horrible, maniacal cackle that echoed off the walls. My entire body tensed up, and before I knew it, my hand had slipped off the doorknob and I was backing away from the door, back into the apartment. That was the last time I tried to leave. Now, it's like the apartment has a life of its own. No matter where I go, no matter what I do, I can feel it watching me. I've covered the mirrors, the windows, everything, but it doesn't help. The shadows move even when there's no light to cast them. They crawl along the walls, twisting and contorting into shapes that shouldn't exist. Sometimes I see faces in them, twisted, grotesque faces staring at me with those same black empty eyes I saw in Katie. I tried smashing the Ouija board. I thought maybe if I destroyed it, I could end all of this. But when I hit it with the bat, it didn't even leave a mark. The board just sat there, taunting me, as if it knew I couldn't get rid of it. That's when I realised, this thing, whatever it is, wants me here. It's feeding off of me. Every time I get scared, every time I lose sleep, it gets stronger. The voices get louder, the shadows get bolder, and the bruise on my arm. It's spreading faster now, creeping up my neck. I can feel it reaching for my face, for my eyes. I haven't told anyone, not even Amanda. She texted me once, asking if I'd heard from Katie, but I didn't respond. I didn't see the point. What am I supposed to say? That her friend's gone? That she's part of whatever this thing is now? That I'm next? Last night was when I hit rock bottom. I had a nightmare, except I'm not even sure it was a nightmare anymore. It felt too real. I was back in the attic, standing in the dark, and the box was there again. But this time, when I opened it, it wasn't empty. Katie was inside. She was curled up, her body twisted and broken, her black eyes staring up at me. Her mouth was moving, but no sound came out. She was trying to say something, trying to warn me. But then, before I could move... Before I could do anything, the shadows wrapped around her and pulled her deeper into the box until she was gone. I woke up in a cold sweat, my heart racing. I felt this overwhelming sense of dread, like something terrible was about to happen. I looked down at my arm and the bruise had spread all the way to my chest. My skin was cold, like ice, and I could feel that same burning sensation deep under the surface. And then I heard it. Not a whisper this time not a scream. It was the front door. The door creaked open on its own, slowly like it had been unlocked from the other side. I sat up, staring at it, my body frozen in place. I wanted to run, to hide, but I couldn't. I was too scared, too trapped. The air in the room got colder and I saw it, something moving in the doorway. It was a shadow, but not like the others. This one was solid, its form shifting as it stepped into the room. It didn't look human, it was too tall, too thin, its limbs bending at unnatural angles. Its head was tilted, just like Katie's had been, and as it moved closer, I saw its eyes. Black. Empty. The same eyes I'd seen in the attic. The same eyes Katie had. It stopped in the middle of the room, staring at me. 
I couldn't move. I couldn't even scream. My body was paralyzed with fear, and all I could do was watch as it raised one long, bony finger and pointed at me. Ask them, it whispered. I tried to speak. Tried to ask who they were, but my throat was dry, my voice gone. The shadow moved closer, until it was right in front of me, its face inches from mine. I could feel its breath, cold and rancid, as it whispered again. Join us! And then, everything went black. I don't know how much time has passed since then. Hours? Days? I don't even know what's real anymore. I'm still in the apartment, but it feels different. The walls are closing in. The shadows are everywhere. I can't escape them. They're inside me now. I can feel them crawling under my skin, whispering to me, telling me things I don't want to hear. The bruise has covered my entire body. It's not just a mark anymore. It's part of me. I can feel it pulsing, moving, like it's alive. I don't think I'm alone anymore. I keep hearing voices. Katie's voice. Amanda's voice. Even voices I don't recognise. They're all saying the same thing over and over. We're waiting. We're waiting for you. I know what they want. I know what's going to happen next. I'm not writing this for help. There's no help coming. I know that now. I'm writing this because I need someone to know what happened. To know that I didn't just disappear. That I didn't just go crazy. If you're reading this, be careful. Don't mess with things you don't understand. Don't open doors you can't close. Because once you let them in, once they mark you, you're never getting out. They're waiting for me now. I can feel them. They're right outside the door, watching, waiting. And I think it's time to join them.